who tonight is Shrenik Ganatra, um, from originally from Mumbai, India, in Brooklyn hey, now. How, how long have you been in, in Brooklyn? I have been in Brooklyn since July 1st, 2017. And I was in Baltimore previously, where I studied. And then before that in India. So you studied in the US and stayed there then? Huh? You 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 studied in the US and then you decide, all right, this is the place where I want to live? Yeah, I came here with the intention of going to grad school and pursuing yeah. my design journey. And then the idea was, let's see where it takes us. And it's taken me to Brooklyn and here we are. Well, it's funny that you say, let's see, let's see where this takes us, because you are going to talk about process. And this is yes. always very interesting because only seeing the end result is only half of the story. So I'm really interested in hearing from you how you solve problems and get from point A to B to your end result. So if that's okay for you, if you're ready, I would say um, the floor is yours and take it away. Amazing. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Erin. Thank you to the A Type I team for having me here second time in two years. I'm really excited to meet you all. Hello, Olga, Owen, Satoru, Tamie. I'm just going through the list and everybody else. Uh, my name is Shrinik. I am originally from Mumbai. I'm a designer and educator based in Brooklyn. And my presentation is about process, which is the nonlinear, messy, revealing journey to solve a problem, which is what designers do for the most part. Like I mentioned before, this presentation, it's about process, which is a key ingredient in your journey as a designer on how you solve a problem. I'm currently based in Brooklyn. This is a photograph that I took from my rooftop, I think during probably my first six months uh, after moving to the city. Having lived here since July, 2017, I have worked at small design studios, um, designing exhibitions for museums, working with typography and using it for branding, using it for animation, using it for publication design so on and so forth. Some of the people that I've had the opportunity to work with include Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum in New York, Type Directors Club in New York, Apollo Theater in New York, the Glass House in Connecticut, Library of Congress in DC, and the Shillington School of Graphic Design where I currently teach. Aside from that, I also design custom typefaces and I've been doing that since 2014. Um, I don't have a publisher. I sell them on my Behance. I'm currently working on my website as well, but this is an overview of some of the work that I have done over the, over the last few years. And then I've been fortunate enough to have my work featured in small businesses and at the same time, high level Hollywood productions that include movies like Ad Astra, NBC's Colony, Mission Impossible, and Uber's collaboration, and um, CBS's Blood and Treasure. So that was a very uh, fortunate happening in, in my journey as a type designer. So let's talk about the design process, which essentially is the design thinking process. It is a framework by which designers solve a problem you can also apply this framework to anything that you do in life. And this essentially has six steps. It includes empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test, and implement. So whenever you're solving a problem, these are the, the, the steps that you take knowingly or unknowingly. So for example, if someone comes to you and tells you, okay, I need a brand or I need a logo for my brand, help me design it. So logically speaking, step number one would be you would go and talk to them. You would try and find out as much about the brand as possible. Take your notes, create a mental map of how you're going to approach it. 
So that falls under empathize stage, the initial empathizing with the audience or your client. Once you have obtained your notes, then you start defining a problem. What is it that you're trying to solve? In this case, you're trying to make a logo for the business that represents the business. So that comes in the defined stage where you define who are you designing it for? What are you designing? What is it trying to solve? Then comes ID8. Once you've defined things, you put your thinking hat on, you try and come up with ideas, concepts. Once that is finalized, you try and create or simulate those concepts, which falls under prototype. Once you have a prototype ready, maybe in this case, it would be a sketch of the logo or your first draft. You would send it back to the client for testing purposes. The client will get back to you saying that, oh, this is working, this is not working. Based on that, you would jump back to the initial stages. And that once again involves repeated ideation, prototype, and testing. Once the testing is finalized, once the client tells you, yes, this is great, that's when you implement it. So that's the design thinking framework. And I gave you a design-related example. This example or this framework can also be applied to you know, things like making breakfast. It, it's very similar to that. So for instance, if you want to make breakfast for, let's say, your partner or your family, first step would be you ask them what they want to eat, what they like. You try and get to know them a little bit better or their taste that falls under empathize. Once you learn about what they like, you, tr you try and define, okay, this is my skill set. This is what I can cook. Let's see what the options are. Once you've had those options, you start you know, looking up recipes or ideating, looking for ingredients, seeing what you have. So that's your, you know, that's, that falls under the, the ideation phase. Same thing with prototype. Again, once that is done, you start cooking while you're cooking. In this case, a prototype and test would work hand in hand because you would be seeing for things like, oh, do we have enough salt, you know, or if it's a safe, if it's a sweet dish, is there enough sugar, so on and so forth. Once you've tested enough times, once you're happy, you would implement it, you would serve that beautiful dish to your family, right? So that process can be applied to anything that you do in life. It, it's not just design centric. And in our work, we use it extensively. But before I talk about that, I want to talk about a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about my roots. So I'm from Mumbai. I spent the first 23 years of my life there. I grew up there. I went to undergrad there. If you haven't been, this is what it looks like. You know, it's a, it's a good combination of water, blue skies, gray skies, a lot of commotion, a lot of colors, a lot of festivals. And outside of design, you know, some of the things that I really love are obviously I'm from India, so I have to love cricket grew up in that country, grew up watching the game, absolutely love dogs, give me chocolate cake any day of the week, I'll eat it or anything that's chocolate related. And I also um, happen to write music on the side and I have a band on the side. So working with analog equipment and, and music is a big part of my life. Um, when I was 19, I had this dilemma of whether to pursue my journey in information technology, which I was studying in my undergrad, or to do something that I really enjoyed. At that time, I didn't really know what that was. And I decided, okay, information tech is good, but I got into that because there wasn't enough career counseling and all of my friends were doing that. So once I realized that that's really not what I wanted to do, I went back to my early days when I used to draw a lot. Um, and the whole, a very good moment in those four years of my undergrad was a UI UX class that I took um, for one of the courses. And that taught me the importance of typography on the screen. So combining my interest for drawing and the newfound love for type on screen, I just began thinking about what my options were and how could I make this work uh, in my journey. So I started drawing letters individually and also in different compositions just to understand how the forms would work in different styles in different textures with different elements so on and so forth so these were some of the specimens that i did between 2012 and 2013 i believe at this point and then i applied to grad schools in the us fortunately i got accepted 
in Baltimore at the Maryland Institute College of Art, where I spend, spent a couple years getting my MFA and getting formal training in design. And then I moved to New York. I found a amazing, I found an amazing internship with Carlson Wilker. Those are, um, they are German and Icelandic um, guys who started an awesome multidisciplinary design studio in New York about 20 or so years ago. And while I was a student, I had read about their work. I had read about their, their ethics and, and, and you know how they operate as a studio. And I really was captured by their story about immigrants starting a design studio in New York. I love their style and I really enjoyed the, 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 the view that I had of them as people. And I applied there, I got in, and that was a three month internship, which was an eye opening experience for someone uh, who was about to start their journey in a new country with without having had any other job experience in in america and even to this day those guys and i we are very close you know i happen to stop by at their studio it's it's about two miles from my house and they're kind enough to entertain me and and, and you know talk to me about what i'm doing and what they're doing and it's it's nice to share journeys so over the course of three projects i'm going to show you a little bit about my process and how i came to solve a particular problem so this project cycles of animation uh, it's a album art design slash branding slash packaging for a jazz artist called sean lovato that i did during my internship at carlson Wilker. The interesting part about this brief was my creative director, Jan, at the time had told me that I would love for you to design an identity for this music without actually listening to the music. So keeping that challenge in mind, he told me that this was meant to be a formal exercise. You're not thinking about anything else. You're just reacting to what you're seeing on the screen or in front of you and then almost using the following step to lead you to the next one. And this was a two week intensive exercise. So he hands me a piece of paper. He's like, okay, do whatever you want. So I start writing, I start drawing. Then he was like, okay, let's do more. So I start scribbling. And then I started poking these shapes out in the paper. And then we realized that, okay, this is getting somewhere. We're getting some nice forms. Let's see what can be done out of that. So I scanned them in, traced them, copied it into Illustrator, converted them into digital forms. And that was the, the, the next step in the process. First, you started all analog, you scanned it in, converted into 2D forms. Then he asked me, see where you can push this. So after a, a few iterations, I experimented with the 3D tool in Illustrator and, and came up with these beautiful forms. So if you observe, the edges of these forms correlate with these over here. So the structure of the 3D forms, even though it might look spatially different, it is derived from the previous step. So one thing led to another. And then I started having more fun and almost like reacting to what I was seeing, like I mentioned previously, and started creating these compositional landscapes without thinking too much about the brief, without thinking too much about the practicality of where that's going to take me. Then I started adding color, which became even more enjoyable. With that, I had about 50 to 80 iterations of these beautiful landscapes. And once all those compositions were finalized, we incorporated type. So starting from analog, then going into 2D realm, then going into 3D black and white, adding color, bringing in type, then contextualizing the layout in the context of a digipack. So as you can see, the front and the back and the spine it's almost like tell, telling a narrative and using your understanding of design principles to convey the visual communication necessary for this brief. 
And then also we had to think about the inside and how the inside would correlate to the front, completing the entire story storytelling process. So this was a very fun project overall, where in a matter of two weeks, I learned to be free as a designer knowing how to use your limitations or the constraints that are given to you by the client and reacting to what you're seeing, letting the process drive the next stage rather than thinking too much about how I wanted certain things to look. And that experience is something that I still hold very close to my heart and my design practice even to this day. The next project that I want to share about is an identity for the Design Fabric Festival that me and my friend Nenad Kale, he was my collaborator and my classmate at MICA. And we were commissioned to design and conceptualize and art direct the branding for this international design festival that was held in my hometown of Mumbai in 2018. The idea was that this festival would bring together international speakers, national speakers, design enthusiasts, and design students in the country, just so that the design scene in India can evolve. They can learn from what the world is doing, where everybody gets to share their process. Students get to learn, designers get to meet other designers. It was a beautiful opportunity that was conceptualized and realized in 2018. This is what it looked like. This was a final, it was almost, I think, about 500 people attended the, the whole festival. And going back to the roots, these were some of the email uh, extracts that, that I was able to pull through from what I had sent to the organizers. So knowing that it was about India, I told them that I was thinking about the element that really defines or is consistent across the contemporary India, which is diversity and chaos. The former, which is diversity, I believe falls into the more predictable category and has been done before. So many diversity examples have been done using design, combining several elements from the, the Indian cultural heritage. And I wanted to do something different that didn't really include that diversity aspect. So I went with chaos. And what's better than the chaos of the traffic, those jam-packed streets of India? I wanted to sort of visualize that. I had that conversation with Nanad. Together we were like, okay, let's see where we can take this. And our very first draft was based on the concept of stuck in the fast lane, which meant to give the overview of two side, it was almost like a highway where on one side, you have the jam-packed traffic, which was denoted by this condensed, really tightly packed type. And on the other side, you had a little bit of a freedom to move around, which is almost like the grass is greener on the other side when you're driving, when the other side of the road seems sparse than, than yours, right? So they were called Design Fabric Supply at the time. So we were brainstorming certain ideas on how to make it work. And then the example on the very right, the third example was a zoomed in view of how we could further incentivize the chaos and bring some scale into play. Then they also had an abbreviated form. They also went by DSGN for design, FBRC for fabric, SBLY for supply. So we tried out a few things with the abbreviated form and trying to see how it would work. So in this case, you're seeing the company name in bold. Then you're seeing the event title in the normal way and all the other information about the event, event to the side and at the bottom. So those were the initial concepts. Then we started adding color, started throwing in images just to see how, if we were to incorporate an image, how it would work. But then I realized, wait a minute, I subconsciously picked the colors of the Indian railway system or the, the trains in Mumbai. So 
on the next slide, this is a bit from um, our presentation where we talk about the process. But as you can see, the three colors of red, lavender, white, and a, and a hint of gray was something that depicted the trains. So Nanav and I, we talked about trying to do something with that because nobody else had incorporated that, that sentiment of the trains in their design before. And to those who are not from India or who haven't heard about the trains and the chaos in, in Mumbai, it is the lifeline of Mumbai. The entire city depends on the train. If this, if this train stops for, for a whole day, it is the only thing that can make the city shut down. It's, it's considered the city that never sleeps and the trains are the lifeline of that city. So the second concept was the lifeline of Mumbai, paying an homage to the trains. So th these were the initial explorations of the identity and seeing how that can be furthered into assets and elements and how can we make sense of it. So at the top, the 12 stripes are derived from the stripes on the train. And the reason why they were 12 in this iteration was because the trains have 12 coaches. So each stripe represented a coach. The colors were borrowed from the train. Then we started experimenting of what if we took that element and bumped it up? How would that look on the posters? What if we warped it? How would that look on the posters? What if we experimented it with it a little bit? We gave it a sense of motion. How would that go with the event posters? Then played around with typography. Incorporated images, because that was also an integral part of sharing posters. And then the feedback that we got from the client was at that time, that was too experimental. So they asked us to simplify. So this whole concept, in the entire concept, we stuck with the idea of the trains and being inspired by it and using the color palette and some of the graphic elements and trying to come up with an identity that's really fresh and unique at the time. So as the second iteration of that concept, we tried experimenting with the slashes or with the graphic elements on the train in place of the eye. And we thought this is really interesting. This gives us opportunity to incorporate motion in the background. So this, these were some of the initial explorations. We also experimented with an alternate color palette, some more layout variations. So this was a very quick brainstorming session between the two of us before we sent it back to the organizers. And then this is where it started to get really interesting. The more stripes we added, the more we realized that we could break free of only having to use 12. And this could indicate a sense of motion in a particular direction. And we could combine it with type, vary the, the thickness of these strokes, the red strokes you're seeing here, to create some interesting compositions. And that one thing led to another. And then we realized that the opportunity to expand the eye at will using stripes and having the stripes go in left and right, indicating the northbound and the southbound direction of the trains further strengthened the concept. And then these were the identity or the logo explorations where we showed the client how the logo can be variable depending on the context. So there wasn't just one version of the logo. It could be translated into n number of forms. Some of the poster iterations, keeping in mind the identity, once again, incorporating the images, trying to keep that angle consistent and showing how type image and other graphic elements can work together. So that was awesome. That was a direction that they picked. They gave us some feedback which was to further simplify it. And based on that, we created a series of collaterals. So here we go. So as I mentioned before, the logo that we were able to create was responsive, which meant that if we were showing it on the big screen, you would see a horizontal iteration of the logo that filled the entire screen. If this were to be on a postcard or a publication, you would perhaps go with something vertical, 
if it was just the logo, then you would use something that's minimal like this. So every iteration of the logo has it had a use case scenario, which really made the identity interesting for us. And then we evolved it into a fully fledged system where we incorporated secondary levels of type, tertiary levels of type, and seeing how the type and assets and color could work together to create these beautiful patterns. I thought we had something really interesting that the client also liked. So on the left, you're seeing the event poster that launched the narrative of what the festival was about, 30 speakers, um, 35 hours of talks, workshops, so on and so forth. On the center, it's more of a pattern-based approach. And to the right, it then talks about the specific speakers that were going to be there at that event. Then the whole visual language translated into a bunch of social media assets that we were able to use throughout the course of the festival. The black was introduced to indicate a sponsored event. So the organizers had sponsored with Red Bull Music for certain music events, and they wanted us to use black for that part of the asset just to showcase that it's a sponsored event. And it's, it's, it's almost like paying respect to your sponsor. This is the website, once again, translating that system across your desktop form and the mobile form using the system that we had established. Then the publication design that included bios for all the speakers, all of the rundown of the events, a schedule, a map, a list of credits, so on and so forth. Then we had merch produced, some signage based on the identity. So over the course of four months, we were able to see this identity evolve from the grassroots to the production stage, which was a beautiful experience to see. And then it also included motion. So I'm going to, going to play this video. It does have sound. Let me know if it doesn't play well. So the idea of including sound made it so much more realistic. It further enhanced the identity. So we started out with colors. We started out with typography. Then I asked the organizers if we could get some field recordings of the train sounds just so that we could incorporate in the social media or promotional videos to bring a sense of realism. And they really enjoyed seeing the, the brand come to life via these videos. Then there were also a secondary form of exploration with videos where they had to announce speakers. And I was also able to score a background track for this. So here's the, here's the preview of one of the announcements. <laughs> So once again, further evolution of the sound, combining synthesized soundscapes with the field recordings, adding it to the brand to bring it to life. That's the power of design. And this is the final slide in, in this case study showcasing Christoph Neiman He's talking about his work, um, an amazing human being and designer. So that was the entire team that collaborated with us. That's Nanath to my right, that's me. Both of us, we were we had day jobs at the time. I was based in New York, he was based in DC. 
And after we would come home, we would collaborate. I would work between 9 p.m. and 12 a.m. He would take over at 12 a.m. He would work until 4 a.m. And we had this process going on for about two and a half months. And then I had the opportunity to go back to my hometown for about a month where I was able to take leave from work. That opened up a lot of time. So I was able to physically be there for the production, making sure everything was was all right. So it was a beautiful experience, which once again, ingrained the importance of how a rigorous process can create a beautiful design solution. And then the third part that I really want to show you is something that I haven't shared before. This is an upcoming identity for the Shillington Graduate Showcase. So Shillington students are graduating in December, on December 17th specifically, and they have campuses in Australia, um, England, or the UK rather, and New York. They also have online courses. So to celebrate the, the students' graduation, I had pitched to create an identity. This was a screenshot that we took the day everything shut down. Sorry, the photo that we took the day everything shut down. This was March 13th, 2020, last day on campus. And we were coming back in September in person. So for this iteration of the grad show, mm -hmm. I wanted to highlight the essence of our spirit as a team and how we survived the pandemic. So when I send the branding pitch, this is what I mentioned. During the pandemic, no one knew how long the pandemic would last or its long-term impact on the business. How would we as a team build a remote environment grounded in the same principles as face-to-face -face learning? So previously the institution had only face-to-face -face learning needs, but due to the pandemic, they were left with no choice. We had to go remote, set up a remote system which we did, we figured it out over time, collaboratively, efficiently, incorporating feedback, implementing changes, learning from each other, made tough decisions. So in, in essence, we adapted. So I wanted to capture that concept of adaptability in the work and obviously coming home or coming back was a wonderful feeling for both teachers and students and that spirit was captured with a word that I'm gonna tell you in a couple of slides. So taking back to the design thinking process in the ideate phase, I was coming up with a few keywords that could help drive the design direction. Three of them that stuck really with me were ascending, kinetic, and striking. Two of these ascending, kinetic, indicate a sense of motion, striking, indicates a sense of appeal, a sense of memorabilia. So with those two touch points in mind, I started pulling references of what are some of the things that I would love to visualize in an identity. And based on those references, I had figured out that variable type would be awesome because we're talking about adaptability. Arrows would be great because we're talking about direction. I wanted to play with scale since we're talking about the striking feature, the, the memorability of the design, right? I also wanted to incorporate serifs and a complementary color palette. So these were some of the ideas that I was playing with. It's almost like going to a restaurant and you know picking the things that you like from a buffet. That's exactly what this process was. Then I started creating first iterations or first drafts of the posters just to see how the identity could look. This evolved into a series of posters. And the word that I was talking about is revive that indicated the spirit of things going back to normal or at least seeming to go back to normal when we had first started in September this year. So these were some of the initial explorations that I had sent out to my client, which was our leadership team at Shillington. And then this showcased how the identity could evolve over time, wherein, in addition to revive, you could have words such as reform, retry, renew, so on and so forth. Based on that, they picked this example. They were like, let's explore the, this idea. We love the idea of overlapping circles with the type. Let's see where you can take it. So using this as a starting point, started brainstorming some ideas, 
create it, a beautiful warping, some flexibility indicated with this rope, always pointing to the brand, kinetic typography in the background, some more iterations. So in this case, the second, third, fourth posters were derived from the first one, which essentially is, it's almost like a system of LED lights and each poster has certain lights enabled to showcase a different configuration of the word revive. And you're building all of the assets around it from a compositional standpoint. Experimented with more colors, more forms, more layouts. Then the feedback that I got from the client was these colors look too bright. They would love to have the kinetic type as the focal point. They realized that in the previous instances, kinetic typography almost took a backseat. So they wanted me to pull back a little, simplify it, go back to kinetic type. So these were my starting points. I went back to the drawing board, looked at my initial presentations, looked at the references, and then created a system wherein I could have a stacking of the word revive. This also works very similarly as to the one that they had rejected, but now I was able to strengthen it using arrows, using serifs, using colors, so on and so forth. From this iteration, they asked me to explore with more colors. They, they had liked the use of pink in the, in, the, in the posters and in the identity. So they were like, let's see if you can come up with a color system that goes well with the posters and the identity. I also showed them how the animation aspect of kinetic typography could work. Because if the type is movable and a lot of the promotion is going to happen on a digital media, it better animate. So this was an, 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 a concept, a very rough draft of what it could be. So from there, these were the posters that were derived for pastel color systems. Kinetic typography meant that I could come up with n number of layouts once the parameters were defined, which was you would have four columns or four rows of the word revive. And within that, you would incorporate all of the essential information, including your arrows. From a conceptual standpoint, these arrows are meant to point the journey of the students, which is why they're not in the straight line. Every arrow is different, indicating that each student goes through a different journey during their time at, at Shillington as students. There is one loop in every poster. And once again, from a conceptual standpoint, that showcases that one tough patch, that rough patch that students find themselves in halfway through the course and they always push through. So the arrow was meant to be an indicator of a student's journey during their time at Shillington. And then they absolutely love the concept. So these, this, were, this, this was almost a pattern-based poster and the previous ones were derived from these ones. So once again, the concept of LED lights were in based out of this configuration, you could create different layouts. It still held true for the new concept, but in this case, kinetic typography was the focal point. Then the same concept was applied to the certificates that will be given out to the students on the 17th of this month. These are some of the invites that have been gone to the industry. And each of the invite is different in terms of its layout, in terms of how type behaves in that layout, courtesy of the variable typography. And then comes the animation. So I was able to create several of these animations to promote the, the graduate showcase. These are a few more examples. And the beauty about these animations is, is that they are all tied to a separate rhythm. So I am animating them based on a soundtrack in the background that I have muted for these animations, just so that there is context by which movement happens, including a sense of rhythm made sense with movable typography. And this is the animation that I made for the website which is also going to go live on December 17th. 
And this is how it looks at this point. So this is a screenshot of the home page, which showcases a frame in the animation. To the right, you're seeing how it behaves in a responsive context. Some of the interior spreads of, of the website. So this is the gallery where, you're, where you would click on each of these tiles to go to the campuses. And as you hover over each of these, the type changes. So once again, tying it back to the kinetic typography. These are some of the Zoom backgrounds that we have created. So some campuses are not having in-person graduation due to COVID restrictions. So creating Zoom backgrounds was a good way of unifying the grad experience for the virtual classrooms. These are some of the postcards that were created that will be given out to the students. And these essentially serve as something they could leave behind with potential employers or send to potential employers with a custom message and their, the link to their website and the Instagram. So it's almost like a leave behind or a souvenir that you would give to your employer or a potential employer after the interview or even before the interview process. A couple more iterations of these. And those were the three main design related projects. And I wanna quickly talk about how I also use some of that in my music as well. So I write songs in a band called Menakshi. We are based in Brooklyn. And being a designer and also practicing music on the side means I could use all of my design training to give the music a sense of identity. And we have released about 30 songs over the course of three years. The band has been active. And each iteration is based on a design concept that ties to a theme. So on the first row or in the first row, color is being used to evoke a sense of dreamlike state. In the second row, pattern is being used to indicate the roots uh, of the band members of you know, Turkish Indian heritage. And these artworks were, were, were from the open collection at the Met. And each of these artwork has sentiment to some of the emotional qualities in a song. And that idea is further developed in the music that we released last year, uh, where each of these symbols relate to some of the some of the lyrics, lyrics or metaphors in a particular piece of music. And it was really nice to see how we could translate that into cassettes. We put them out on our band camp. They were gone in like two days. CDs are also coming back. So it was really nice to see the translation of digital design into a physical media. And then we are releasing a new album next year. And I wanted to play around with the concept of fabric and how adaptable and how fluid fabric is. And it can take on a shape of, of a body form. And I wanted to sort of represent the band members without having their face on the album indicating our collaborations. So essentially the shapes in the fabric they have been derived from all of our bodies. So that's our drummer, Steve. And we shot photographs. We shot hundreds of these in a studio. And then I was able to use Photoshop to cut them out and turn them into abstract forms for the lack of a better term. And that concept dictated how the rest of the slides look. Whoops, looks like it's stuck on my end. There you go. There you go. So this was the previous slide. And then this is the next one. That's the rough, that's the final. So once again, coming up with that just one concept of fabric and fluidity and seeing how that can be applied to the process helped me come up with iterations upon iterations for the final artwork. These were then applied on the vinyl, which, which uh, we are releasing in May next year and then the booklet. And this is where I would like to end my presentation. These are my links. Uh, I am working on my website currently, so I don't have a website yet, but you can follow my work on Behance, check it out. I'm not really active on Instagram, but if anybody wants to check out, that's my Instagram handle. If anybody's curious about the music, it's minakshi.bandcamp.com, or you can look up Minakshi on any streaming services. It's M-I-N-A-X-I. That is it for me. Thank you so much for having me.
And actually, and that was that was the question. It was what's your band's URL? Now we know. That was yeah. <laughs> that was Eve's yeah, question. Yeah. I'm a drummer myself, so I was immediately interested. So that's great. Also for all the streaming people. Lots of happy people. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's very atmospheric music where we combine a lot of guitar driven textures with Indian classical music as well. So I sort of bring in my roots and then we have Western guitar based elements and alternative rock. So it's it's basically a fusion. Super. That's great. I want to check it out. So it's 10 to well, 10 to midnight for me, but 10 to the hour. So um, I don't know if we have room for questions. Um, I think most people will watch it also later. Um, um, otherwise, I, I would say, why don't we just move to the Hangout and hang out there? I, unless, Aaron, do you have questions or? No, we didn't have any extra questions from the guests. No. I love the way you present. And it was, it was also nice to see this. I loved your presentation last year or the last time too, showing, um, yeah. it's, it's been fun to see you progress. I love the way you, uh, you know, I can tell you're a great teacher. I love it. I, I love the Thank way you, you. describe it. We do this day in, day out, right? We teach live in the classroom. So I was like, might as well now that we are used to it. <laughs> um, but the first time I did it, it was daunting to present live. <laughs> Super smooth. Um, yeah, I loved um, all the motion in the piece. Oh, actually, I guess I do have a question. So the Design Fabric Festival, is that the identity? Are they going to reuse that each year? Or each time no, year? so unfortunately, that event was marred by the Me Too movement. So one of the oh, organizers... Yeah. One okay. of the organizers was caught in the Me Too movement and everything went downhill. So all of oh, the three hundred people yeah, who had worked, they were like, We are going out. And that event never followed. Never came back. Okay. Never Shoot. Came back. Right. It hasn't been it was a beautiful event. It was just such a shame that that had to come out a few months later. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, on that happy note, well, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> let's see. Oh, Nishil had a comment. Yeah, it's a good yeah. conference. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, great. Absolutely. Thank you, Nishil. Um, <laughs> yeah, I want to go back home. I haven't been home in, in two years, and it's because of COVID, it's been difficult to mm. find a slot for a visa renewal and all of that. Right. What a mess. Gosh, let's hope it's all over soon. Okay. Well, thank but you thank so you. much. Thank you so much. And I yeah, that was a great mention. presentation, man. Thank you. I will also mention the links in the Slack in case anybody wants to, you know, message yeah. me or reach out. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. See you in the room. See you in the hangout. Bye. Bye.